Hello, my name is Shirley Tillman, and I'm a professor of molecular biology at Princeton University. For the last two or three years, I have been puzzling over the nature of the stresses and the strains that have clearly engulfed the US biomedical research enterprise. I have been speaking to my colleagues here at Princeton and around the country while I've given talks about this subject. I've written about it with my co-authors, Harold Varmus, Bruce Alberts, and Mark Kirshner, and really trying to identify the source of the stresses and the strains, which are very real, and then to work on uh, solutions to those kinds of problems. What I'm going to talk about today is what I think is at the root of the stresses and strains, and I call it the Malthusian dilemma in biomedical research. So I think uh, all of you know that Thomas Malthus was a demographer, an English demographer in the 18th century, and his central observation was that when a population is increasing exponentially, but the resources to support it are only increasing arithmetically, there comes a point, which he called the point of crisis, when basically the resources can no longer support the population. And what I'm going to argue is that's exactly what's been happening in biomedical research. So let's first of all look at what has happened to the resources that support the enterprise. So what we're looking at here is uh, a graph of NIH funds. And the bars I want you to focus in are the blue bars, which represent the inflation-adjusted dollars available to support biomedical research from the NIH. And you can see here, if you look at the blue bars, that after the doubling of the NIH budget, which ended in 2003, there has actually been a steady erosion in the spending power of the NIH budget to the point that in 2015, the year that we are in, the spendable dollars are almost exactly what they were in 2000 when the NIH doubling was just beginning. So there is no arithmetic increase in resources. The resources are, have actually stagnated over the last 15 years. But what has happened to the population? Well, the population has continued to grow. So this is uh, the production of new PhD scientists over the last uh, 25, 30 years. But if we just focus on the period of time in the last slide, there has actually, over that period of time, been a 50% increase in the production of life science PhDs, almost entirely accounted for, as you can see here, by the increase in the number of biomedical scientists. And now we have the classic Malthusian dilemma. So how has this felt? Well, it's felt, most importantly, by the youngest members of our community, the graduate students and the postdocs, who 25, 30 years ago probably felt that they were in a very smooth pipeline where the number entering the field was equivalent to the number who were leaving the field and finding employment that took advantage of their training. What we now see today is clearly a bulging pipeline. And probably the best um, demonstration of the bulge is the fact that training is becoming longer and longer, particularly at the postdoctoral level, so that the average age at which someone achieves an independent position in an academic uh, uh, institution is now approaching 37 and a half years of age. This is a sign of a bulging pipeline. But the problems are not just felt by the young. They're also felt by members of the community who are trying to uh, attract resources for their laboratories with research grants, who are trying to publish papers, which are the coin of the realm in science, who are trying to mentor their young investigate, their young trainees, uh, to get them out of the lab and into productive uh, jobs in the future. And so this image, which I took from Science Magazine, I think very accurately reflects the sense of the hyper-competitive environment that currently exists because of the Malthusian dilemma, which has been summarized as too many people 
chasing too few resources. So the question is, what can we do about this? And I would argue that we can't really solve this dilemma until we confront the Malthusian nature of the way in which we have been training biomedical scientists over the last 50 or 60 years, and that is we have been primarily depending on trainees. So in this cartoon here, I'm representing graduate students and postdoctoral fellows who are really the worker bees of the biomedical enterprise. And very few members of a, this is an 11 person lab, very few members of an average 11 person lab would actually be a permanent member of that laboratory. For example, a staff scientist or the PI himself or herself. This is unsustainable. This is what is creating the stresses and the strains. And so what we need to do is to go to a sustainable structure for our research laboratories. And I would argue that that inevitably must include fewer trainees, a greater dependence on the use of uh, permanent members of the laboratory, technicians and staff scientists. And I'm going to actually make the case that by a greater use of core facilities, we can reduce the size of laboratories and therefore reduce the dependence that we currently have on trainees as the major source of work. So what to do? And, and really, I'm going to deliver a fairly positive message here because I think a lot of progress is beginning to be made in addressing these kinds of problems. And I, I want to begin um, with a recommendation that has been around for at least 20 years, which is the first and foremost we need to have honesty in advertising in biomedical science. And that is we have to transparently let all prospective students, students who are thinking about entering that bulging pipeline, let them know uh, what is ahead. And probably most importantly, uh, get them already thinking about what they would do with a PhD. Because today, there are many things that one can do with a PhD. But the earlier you begin to think about that, the more likely that your path to that job is going to be smooth. So transparency. And we recommendations have been uh, offered that each graduate program should be required to provide accurate career outcomes to prospective students. And the wonderful news is that John Lorsch, who is the director of the National Institute for Gen Medical Sciences, has now sent a directive to all training grant PIs asking them to provide that information uh, on the web so it is available to prospective graduate students. Progress, progress. The second place where we have really seen progress is beginning to focus our faculty on diversifying the kinds of training that are available for graduate students. Once again, this is a recommendation that has been around for a long time. There's a wonderful iBio video by Keith Yamamoto where he, he really effectively makes the case for this. But clearly, when I was going through the system, between 60 and 70% of graduate students would ultimately end up in academic jobs. Today, that number is 15%. So we have to be thinking about the 85% who are not going to be in the future in positions that we have classically uh, been training our graduate students to occupy. Again, there's good news, which is the uh, National Institutes of Health under the uh, directorship of Francis Collins created uh, BEST grants. These are grants that are being offered to training programs to experiment with the kinds of diversification that would most effectively prepare uh, this generation of graduate students for the variety of jobs that are going to be available to them. Uh, doing it at the graduate student level makes a great deal of sense because I think one of the things that must happen is, and again, this was a recommendation that Keith made in his iBio video, is that we have to reserve the postdoc for those who wish to go on to research careers instead of allowing it to continue to be the default step, uh, which I think is what it is for many postdoctoral fellows today. We want our graduate students 
really from the beginning of graduate school to be thinking about how they're going to craft their education so that um, they end up in the positions that they are really interested in pursuing. Here's a recommendation that also has been uh, highlighted in an iBio video by Greg Petsko, who chaired a, a wonderful committee called the Postdoctoral Experience Revisited. It has many very wise recommendations in it, but one that I think is going to be important if we're going to really get control of the Malthusian laboratory is we have to pay our postdoctoral fellows uh, in, in a way that reflects both their education and their experience. Uh, once again, uh, I'm happy to say that there's been uh, small progress on this. Stanford University recently announced that it is going to set a uh, floor for the uh, pay of postdoctoral fellows, including in the biomedical sciences, of $50,000. I think that's a fabulous start. Um, but, uh, and clearly one that may incentivize other competitive universities to follow in their suit. Um, whether that is the right number, uh, I'm not prepared to say, but I do think by paying postdocs what they deserve to be paid, uh, there will be fewer of them, and that is clearly one of the advantages of this recommendation, but it's also uh, respecting uh, the quality and the extent of their education. Here is probably uh, the most challenging from the perspective of the community, but I think one of the most important of the recommendations about what to do. And that is we have to really change the ratio of the members of the laboratory who are trainees on their way in that bulging pipeline to new positions relative to the members of the laboratory who will be permanently associated with the laboratory. Um, this is uh, something that has been adopted uh, years ago at the National Institutes of Health, thanks to initiatives led by Harold Varmus. And if you speak to investigators at the National Institutes of Health, they will tell you that contrary to sort of modern myth, uh, having staff scientists, PhD trained scientists as permanent members of your laboratory is an immense advantage and does not decrease productivity, it actually increases productivity. This is not an easy sell, uh, and it is probably one of the hardest recommendations to really get buy-in from the community, but I think unless we head in this direction, it's really gonna be hard to get our handle on this Malthusian dilemma. And then the last recommendation, which I've alluded to briefly uh, uh, before, is uh, we're very much, uh, taken with the idea of increasing the number of core facilities. Um, we think this is a much more effe efficient and effective way to conduct research, but it also provides employment for PhDs who are not interested in running their own laboratory or even working in a research laboratory, but really want to be at the cutting edge of a new technology um, and to provide uh, that new technology to the entire community. Um, this is, uh, I think, a recommendation that will involve both universities uh, getting behind such an idea and the NIH and thinking about funding mechanisms to ensure that they are stable. So where would these recommendations, if they were all implemented, where would we lead? Well, it would lead to a sustainable biomedical laboratory. So what would be the characteristics of that laboratory? First and foremost, they're going to be slightly smaller. and if if they're not going to become slightly smaller, inevitably there have to be fewer laboratories. Second of all, there are going to be fewer postdoctoral fellows uh, and they will be better paid. Third, there will be more permanent members of the laboratory, technicians and staff scientists, and more of the work that is currently being done by trainees will be undertaken by very effective, competent, and technically expert core facilities. And if we can move in the direction of creating this sustainable biomedical laboratory, I think we will go a long way to reducing the kinds of stresses and the strains that currently plague the enterprise today. So I want to end by saying thank you for watching this video. Thank you for listening. And I know that uh, I welcome all feedback 
on this video as do my uh, co-authors.